If you hit the minor prophets, you've gone too far. So this is chapter 12. It's the end of Daniel. And it's the end of our time together. I've really enjoyed teaching you guys through the book of Daniel. I've really enjoyed studying Daniel. I don't think I've ever studied Daniel this in depth before. Um, and I thank you for, for doing it with me. Uh, but just like Daniel is coming to the end, this earth is coming to an end. The earth has an expiration date. It's just like the milk in your fridge. And is it going to be good after the expiration date? <sighs> well, God's going to do a new earth. It's like you have to get new milk. New earth is coming. Um, and we're not going to focus on the new earth in this. We're really just going to focus on the end of this one, um, in this book. If you want to read about what the new earth is like, check out the end of Revelation. The, Re the end of Revelation has got some things. Isaiah, I Isaiah uh, has got a bunch of things about the millennial reign in there. You can read that one. It is good. Uh, but that expiration date is coming up soon. The first four verses of uh, chapter 12 is a continuation of the angel speaking from chapter 11. Uh, so it just kind of, they, they put the chapter uh, marks in a weird spot here. Oh, I forgot to change that one. Am I on the right? I am not on the right. That's chapter 11. Let's try this again. Did I just, no, it's chapter 12. That first slide's wrong. Oh, that tricked me. All right, forget the first slide. We'll just skip to the second slide. Okay, so uh, the first four verses are a continuation from what the angel was saying in chapter 11. And then uh, verse 1 says, At that time Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never, uh, never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And to that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. So, so think about that for a second. All of the stuff, oh, I copied that wrong slide over and over again. You're going to see that wrong slide a lot. I'm just going to skip to the next one. I'm just going to leave it there. Um, you're get, you throw me off. I want to fix it, but I can't. Um, so there's a, you can think of all the times in the past where the Jews have been persecuted, where the, where the Jews have been, been killed and sought after. Um, and we can start going back to all the way to, to Exodus, Exodus chapter 1, when the Pharaoh killed all the babies, or all the male babies, trying to keep the population down, which I'm thinking, you, you got the wrong gender there if you're trying to keep the population down. But, uh, but he, he, he killed them all, just thinking, well, if I kill all the male babies, then, then, then there won't be as many Jews, because there are just too many. We're thinking they might revolt, well, probably because you're killing all their babies. Um, but then that Moses was saved through that. But that was a horrible time of persecution. The one that's coming is going to be worse. And then think of there when, when the Jews went through uh, Ammon and, and Edom on their way to Israel and, and the persecution that they had to, that they had to fight against uh, the Ammonites and Edomites. Okay? The end time is going to be worse than that. And then when they got into the promised land in the book of Judges, the Midianites oppressed them, the Philistines oppressed them. Guess what? It's going to be worse than that. Then when they were in their kingdom and they had it established, the Assyrians and Syrians in the kings, books of the Kings and the Chronicles, and then later on Babylon uh, and Persia uh, oppressed them, it's going to be worse than even that. After Jesus came about, uh, there was the Spanish Inquisition that oppressed the Jews. There was the Nazi Holocaust that oppressed the Jews. It's going to be worse than all of that. How is it going to be worse? I mean, because those were really, really bad. How is it going to be worse than all of that? I don't know. But I know it's going to be worse. Pray for your Jewish brethren. In the end, it's going to be so hard for them. And you know what God says about the Jews, right? Whoever blesses them, he will bless. Whoever curses them, he will curse. So pray for them. Pray for them. They need it. Oh, I was supposed to type, type about Revelation 19.20, wasn't I? Okay, so after, well, during all of that, uh, the, the Antichrist is going to be ruling and reigning in that time. And he's the one who's going to be heading that persecution. And, and Jesus is going to come back at the end of those seven years. And he's going to stop the Antichrist. He's going to throw the Antichrist and, and, Antichrist and the false prophet into the pit. And that's what it talks about in Revelation 19.20. It's about the victory of Christ over them. And from then on, 
Christ is starting a new thing. He's, he, he's rescuing everybody. He's, he's getting all of his people together. He's judging the earth. And, and for anyone who did not rebel against him or took the mark, and if you want to read more about the mark of the beast, is Revelation 13, 16. I was talking to my dentist this morning because guess where I was this morning? At the dentist. Uh, and and he, was saying, he was talking about all these things about the mark of the beast, and I told him, well, well, most of that's speculation. The Bible doesn't have a whole lot to say about the mark of the beast. It says we'll need it to buy and sell things in this world. And, and if we get it, we're rejecting Christ. Like, really? Oh, and, and it's in your hand or your forehead. You know, like, really, that's all we know about the mark of the beast. Everything else is speculation. We don't have a whole lot of verses telling us about it. And, it's, and, and even though I might think that most of the stuff he was talking about is true, it's always good in my mind to separate what I know from the Bible from what we are guessing is going to happen um, because of our own brains or speculation or reading somebody else's book. It's good to know where our information comes from. Um, so if you're interested in the mark of the beast, uh, Revelation 13, 16. Now, hopefully he's just interested in learning about it, not interested in getting it, because you really shouldn't get it. It is a bad thing. But the ones who suffer that horrible persecution at the hands of the Antichrist, who did not get the mark, who did not rebel against the Lord, they will be allowed to enter into the next part of what's going on, and that's the millennial kingdom. That's where God sets up a thousand years of peace and prosperity, where he literally and physically rules the earth from Jerusalem. We, re we read about it back when we did, uh, what was that, Zechariah, where, where it says that people will come to, to, to a Jew and, and hold on to his cloak, says, take me with you to Jerusalem, take me with you to worship. I want to worship with you. And apparently they needed the Jews to take him or something, I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. Uh, but, but it's going to be a special day. The Jews are going to be super happy because... They get to be the people that God made them to be this whole time. Verse 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's going to be two resurrections uh, that that verse talks about. Uh, but already there were several resurrections. The first resurrection we know is Jesus Christ himself. He resurrected from the dead. Now, there are other people who got up from the dead, who woke up from the dead, who Jesus raised from the dead while he was in his earthly ministry. And I think Elijah and Elisha each raised at least one. And, and those are not resurrections. Those are like resuscitation. They were dead, and then they were alive, which is great, but they were, good. They were in their old bodies, and they're going to die again. Whereas Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he was no longer in his old body. He was in, a new, he was in his glorified body. The holes in his hands and the hole in his side were still there. But it was a brand new body for him. And he could walk through walls. He'd appear and disappear. Uh, and and he, even though everyone recognized him, there was still something different about him. And then when we get to heaven, we're going to get new bodies. The next resurrection, or I would say, we, we would call it rapture, is when we get to go be with the Lord in the air. The dead are going to rise out of their graves again. Oh, again. Because when Jesus rose, the Old Testament saints rose out of their graves. And then, and then um, we're going to rise, or the dead in Christ, like our brother Bob, is going to rise again. Um, and, and we are going to meet, meet him and the Lord in the sky. And then we're going to get our new bodies then. And then at the end of the, the seven-year tribulation, there becomes this other uh, resurrection that we just talked about here. Uh, the sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. The resurrection of all the people who believed in Jesus during the tribulation will rise then. And then after the thousand years comes that second one, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Uh, they will rise and they will stand before God in what we call the great white throne judgment. And we call it the great white throne judgment because God's sitting in a great white throne. Obvious, right? But that's where he judges the evil. Where people come before him and he, and he opens the book and says, this is what you did. And they, their knees are bowed. They're, they have to confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord, but they're not confessing with their hearts. He's not their Lord. And they will realize that everything they did to try to escape God failed them. And it will be such a horrible day. They will realize that they deserve to go to hell, which is where you and I deserve to go, by the way. We're not better than them. We're just blessed because we said okay to Jesus while we were still alive. 
We said, you are our Lord. We chose him as our Lord before we died. That's the difference. And his Holy Spirit enters us not because we are righteous, but because he is righteous and we have accepted his righteousness as our own. That's the only reason. So if you want to read about the great white throne judgment, check out Revelation chapter 20, 11 through 15. That's where it talks about there. Verse, oh, in Matthew 14. Why did I write Matthew 14? It will come back later, I guess. No, oh, it's like I didn't save it or something. Uh, verse 3 says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Um, so those who resurrect to everlasting life will be like the stars of heaven, right? It's not, we're not actually going to become stars. This is like we're going to be like the stars who are going to be that kind of bright. Um, and, and, and we're not going to be like a lone star. We're not, I'm not going to be like a lone star trying to outshine the sun. We're going to be part of the big canopy of that symphony of, of stars, visually glorifying and worshiping our, our, our creator. Verse 4 says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So when he says shut the book up, I don't think he means don't tell anybody. I think he's like, okay, this book of prophecy is complete. It is over. Keep it safe. He says, uh, and seal, it, seal the book until the time of the end. Make sure it lasts until the end, which it does because we still got it. We're still reading it. We're still studying it. So that part is, is, is happening. It says, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Now, as I was studying for this, a lot of people were thinking that running to and fro means that we have international travel now. We have worldwide global travel. In the end, there will be global travel and, and knowledge shall increase. We have the internet. I have all of the information in the world at my fingertips whenever I want it. Isn't that cool? Yes, it's cool. Is it good? It depends on if you use it for good or not. You know, it's just any, the internet is a tool like anything else is a tool. If you use it for good, it is wonderful. If you don't, if you use it for evil, it is horrible. I could, I, I could build a house with a hammer or I could kill somebody with one. You know, it depends on what you use the tool for. But I don't think that's what it's talking about because I don't think the angel's like, all right, make sure you keep this until the end. By the way, they're going to be able to travel around the whole world and they have the internet then. Like, I don't think the, the, the angel cares about that stuff. I think he's saying people are going to be running around like crazy trying to figure out what's going on, and you have the answer. Knowledge will increase because they will see what you are writing down. And, this, and if we look at Scripture, like we did last week of chapter 11, where we could see every line by line, in his, it's, it's, pro, it's prophecy from Daniel, and it's historical fulfillment up until Antiochus Epiphany. The first 35 verses of chapter 11, line by line, he says, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and the king is talking about his name Seleucid, or Seleucus, that, name, that king is named Antiochus, and we could like, name these guys because it is so well written down, it's easy to find in history. In the same way, all of these prophecies about the end times, about these final seven years, that everyone's like, well, maybe this is going to happen. Maybe that's going to happen. I think the Antichrist is going to come out of this country. I think the Antichrist is going to come out of that country. I think he's going to be homosexual. I think he's going to do this. You know, and they, they, they have so many theories about it. But when it actually happens, everyone will be going, oh, that's the guy. And if you're ever wondering how I know who the Antichrist is, because I don't think I'll be here. I think I'll be raptured first. But if I am here, I'm going to know who he is. And I'm going to know who he is by the, he's the guy who makes his seven-year covenant with Israel. He gets, he'll, it'll be broadcast around the world. It'll be a great peace agreement. And you know what's going on in Israel now with the Palestinians and Israel firing rockets at each other. It's getting worse and worse. And it's going to be worse. And, and then one guy's going to come in and, sa and says, hey, let's make a deal. And he will make a deal for peace in the Middle East. And it'll be specifically a seven-year contract. And then when that guy makes a seven-year contract, if we're still here, we're like, that's the guy. That's the Antichrist. I will know it by him. Everyone's trying to guess who the Antichrist is before, before he comes out and, and reveals himself. It's like, but it's, I don't care what your guess is. It doesn't do me any good to know who the Antichrist is. Actually, I don't even care who the Antichrist is. I'd rather look for Christ. Wouldn't you rather look for Christ than the Antichrist? I'd rather be more like Jesus. I wanna, I, I'm looking up in the air, hoping he's going to come back any time now. 
Because even though there are things I like to do on this earth, even though my boys are still young and I have not yet seen them grow up, it's better to be with Jesus. It's better for us all to be with Jesus. And guess what? We could enjoy him and each other in the millennial kingdom and in the new heaven and new earth that's coming after that. I don't need to see how the rest of this plays out. I read the preview in the Bible. I don't think I'm going to like it. You guys ever see a movie trailer and you're like, I don't want to see that movie. You know, it's just like, that, like the horror movies, I don't know, like you're watching some movie and they put a horror movie on, like is this movie going to be good if they're showing this trailer in front of the movie? But it's just like, I don't want to see that movie. That looks horrible. Okay, when I read about the, the tribulation, I'm like, I don't want to see that happen. I, I'd rather be in heaven having a wedding feast with Christ. So I'm not trying to study everything that's going to happen so I can like give you a play-by-play Maybe that's what people want to do. They, they study it so hard so they can be a commentator. You're like, oh, and here come the locusts from the pit. You know, and it's like they're just trying to like, they want to, they want to give you a play-by-play of everything that's happening there during, during, the, during the tribulation. And they're like, you think we're going to be up there looking down? I don't think so. All of the loved ones that have gone before us, do you think they're looking down on you? I don't think they're looking down. Why would they look down on us when they can look up to Christ? They can see him face to face. How many of us would look down? I wouldn't look down. I'd be too busy enjoying and worshiping Christ, falling at his feet, and, and, and if I have any crowns to throw at him, I'll throw it. sounds so mean we're throwing crowns at him. But, you know, it's not, let's just lay him at his feet. It's like, you really deserve this, Jesus. I didn't do it. It's our relationship with Christ that matters. It's not whether or not we can, we can pick up who the Antichrist is before he comes to power. And a lot of people read this book looking for that. But the truth is that that is not important. When he comes, it'll be great to have this book. They'll say, oh, look at this, look at that. That's what's going on. Look out. Let's get out of here. If you are living in Israel and the Antichrist makes that deal, get out of town. Because in three and a half years, he's going to make things really, really hard over there. So during the first three and a half years, if you're in Israel, move somewhere else, far away. Preferably to Jordan, because for some reason, he's not going to be able to do anything in Jordan. I think God's going to stop him. Verses 5 and 6 of, of Daniel 12, because that's, that's the book we're studying right now. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and one on the other riverbank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was ab- above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Like, when is this stuff going to happen? And I'm pretty sure Daniel was like, I'm, good. He, I'm glad he asked the question. Because I'm pretty sure Daniel was thinking the same thing. This the angel's telling him all this stuff, and he's like, when is this going to happen? And I would be wondering, when is it going to happen? Um, so there's, there's two other angels, and God doesn't always tell us when stuff's going to happen. Like, he doesn't say, Tuesday. He just says, you know, in the right time. And we get impatient, don't we? We want things to happen now, immediately. Uh, if I know there's going to be a major change in my life, I'm going to start prepping for it immediately, right away. Because, like, I, I'm ready for it to happen. Even if it's not a good change, it's like, I know it's going to happen. Just, just bring it already. I don't want to wait for it. Waiting is always the hardest part for me. Time is, like, this weird thing that changes. You know, like, the, when you're heating something up in the microwave and you're hungry, those are long minutes, aren't they? I got this rice bowl I like to heat up. It takes six minutes in the microwave. Those are the longest six minutes I've ever experienced. Well, I should say the second longest. The, the longest time is, is the last two minutes of a Super Bowl. That's like half an hour. Every time, and so, so time, like it seems like it feels like it changes, right? Um, and, and, and for the same, so Daniel's like, how long? And, and, and he's like, well, I'm not going to tell you. You know, he tells us a time later on, but it's not even like how long from now. It's how long uh, from a certain point. When I was, when I first met my wife, um, I knew pretty early on that I wanted to marry her. She didn't. She just wanted to be friends. And, and I made my intentions pretty clear early on that, like, I'm, I'm hoping that this is going to go towards marriage. And you think that scared her off, but it didn't. She just says, no, we're just going to be friends. And, we, you know, we hang out and get close, and every time we started to get, you know, she started to feel like we were getting too close of a friendship, she'd say, hey, we're only going to be friends. I'm never going to marry you. I get discouraged, obviously, after that. And as I walk away, I hear God's whisper in my heart, just wait. 
Like, wait, how long? And he never told me. He never told me. He just said, just wait. It was like four or five times that this happened. Turns out I was waiting two years. But I grew a lot in those two years. And I learned a whole lot about patience in those two years and trusting the Lord. And she grew a lot too. And one day, God just changed her mind, changed her heart. And, from, and, and she was struggling with that. It took a friend, uh, a friend saying, what are you doing? <laughs> and, 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 and she opened her eyes. And she, and she saw that, that this is something that the Lord had for her. And it was like a different person. Uh, from then on, I, I dated her for about six weeks because uh, I had to save up to buy a ring. And I proposed to her. We were engaged for five months, and then we were married. It was, like, really quick. In fact, a friend asked me to be in his wedding before uh, she changed her mind on that one. So after he asked me to be in the wedding, I got a girlfriend, a fiancé, and a wife, and then I was in the wedding. Like, all of that happened real quick. And God can do amazing things, but we need to wait for his timing. And he can do really hard things like he's going to do for the Jews. Still going to be on his timing. We can't rush God. Don't try it. If you try to rush God, it's not going to work well for you. I don't like that slide. It keeps coming up. Verse 7 says, Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters in the river, who held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all of these things shall be finished. So that's how long it's going to be. Time, times, and a half a time. We know that to be three and a half years from our previous study in Daniel. I'm pretty sure Daniel understood that to be three and a half years. Three and a half years from when? From now? From tomorrow? From next year? Or like when? When is it going to be three and a half years? Okay, Daniel, wasn't, Daniel didn't know either. He says, although I heard, I did not understand. And I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? You guys ever feel like that? You ask a question, they give you an answer, and you're like, I still don't get it. And you feel like such a moron, don't you? It's like, I asked you a question, you answered it plainly, and still, my mind goes, I don't know. I, feel, I think that's what the disciples were like every time Jesus said anything, you know? Jesus would give like this parable, and these disciples were like, yeah, we're close to Jesus. We're helping people. Don't come close to Jesus because he's busy right now. And just like, stop pushing people away. They're supposed to come to me. And he tells them this story in this parable. And the disciples are like, yeah, he's so wise. Hey, Jesus, what does that mean? I don't get it. Okay? Daniel's like that too. And Daniel's like a learned man. He's, he's like the best at everything. And he still doesn't get it. So if you don't get, so if you read the Bible and you're like, I don't get it, that's okay. It's perfectly fine. If you struggle with reading the Bible because you're like, there's so much in here I don't understand, it's perfectly fine. You're in good company. Nobody understands it all. We just talk about the stuff we do understand. And that's the thing. If you're struggling to read the Bible and you're like, I want to read it every day, but I can't read it every day because I get so confused and I don't know what's going on and I just like, Meh. Genesis was okay. That was fine. And Exodus, the first half was great, but then I got to like all of the, the, the building of the tabernacle and stuff, but I don't even know how long a cubit is. And then I got the Leviticus, and then there's just a bunch of laws that we don't, why don't we follow those laws anymore? And then we got the numbers and all the, all the, the counting of all the people and Deuteronomy. It's like the same stuff that Leviticus said. What's going on here? Easy. Read the Bible, and when you understand something, make sure you do that something. That's it. The stuff you don't understand, don't worry about it. One day you're going to read that same passage and you're going to go, that's it. I got it. Now I know what to do with that. God's just going to put it in your head at the right time. So right now you are responsible for what you do know. So make sure you do those things. I, how can you expect God to give you something else if you're not already doing what he told you to do? Verse 9 and 10 says, And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. He just tells Daniel to go away. Like, all right, I'm done talking now. Go away. Seal the book up. Don't worry about it. Many people are going to 
be made white, they're going to be purified, made white and refined. That's us, by the way. I don't know if you've recognized it, but we are made white, not talking about our skin color, not talking about the clothes we wear. I'm talking about our souls washed white by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and, and the Bible says, like, it's, it's whiter than any launderer can make clothes. It's going to be like how your soul is washed by the blood. And can you think, I mean, just try to think of, picture that for a moment. I got a bunch of dirty clothes that I would like to be white. And in my basin, instead of the water, is blood. <coughs> How is that going to work? Well, easy. Because it's not really talking about clothes. The clothes we wear in heaven, by the way, are, are righteousness. Think of Adam and Eve when they were in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says they were naked and they were not ashamed. That really weirded me out when I was young. I started reading the Bible before I was a Christian, and, and I, got to that pa- I got to that passage in chapter 2. I'm like, what is that all about? Why is it talking about naked people? They weren't wearing any clothing, any covering, but they were clothed in righteousness. They were pure in God's eyes. They had nothing to be ashamed over. What, what, what we take as shame at nakedness is really all because of sin. If we didn't have any sin, it wouldn't bother us if we walked around naked. But we do sin, so it does bother us. But when we get to heaven, we'll be clothed in righteousness. I wonder if they glowed. Do you think they glowed? I think that's one of the questions I'm going to ask God when we get to heaven. Did Adam and Eve glow when they were in the Garden of Eden before they ate of that fruit? Because God glows. And, and Moses, when he talked to God, then he glowed just like as a, as a reciprocating glow from Jesus or from God. Because God glowed and Moses glowed and his glow would fade and he'd wear the veil so no one could see it going away. And he'd go talk to God again in the tent of meeting and he'd start glowing again like a little glowworm. Did you guys, you guys have glowworms growing up? Just like that was Moses. Can you imagine how cool it would be if all the Christians just glowed? We walked around and seeing each other. It's like you'd be, they'd be easy to spot, wouldn't they? They wouldn't be allowed in the movie theater. Lights go off. Like half the people are glowing. He's like, you guys got to get out of here. I'm trying to watch this movie. Right? And so, so it's just like, but wouldn't it be cool? I wonder if that's if in heaven if we get to all be glowy. And we're hanging out and, and talking to each other. It would be really easy to spot a, good, uh, a righteous Christian if, if we actually showed it when we glowed. But spiritually, we do. Do you ever talk to somebody and just feel that shine coming from them? And you're like, this is me right here. That's the spiritual glow. We don't always pick up on it. But sometimes, every once in a while, we get it from someone. And usually it's just some stranger encounter that you meet somewhere. Someone was kind to you or needs some help or you needed help and they were there and you're like, that person just felt different. There was something about that person. Maybe it was an angel. And you're like, well, maybe it was an angel, but just could have been a Christian who was empowered by the Holy Spirit and their Holy Spirit connected with the Holy Spirit in you because it's the same Holy Spirit that's in both of you. I don't know how that is. God can just do that. You know, like that, that person believes in Jesus. How cool is that when that happens? So purified, made white, refined, that is us. But the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand. The wise people who are in on the earth during the book of Revelation, during the book of Revelation, during the time of tribulation, we'll be able to look through Daniel and go, this is it, this is the time. And they'll be able to point stuff out. It's like, that guy's the Antichrist. That guy's this man of sin. This guy's the guy in the book. And they will be able to see it. Because we're not going to be there to tell them that's the guy. We'll be gone in heaven. They'll have to figure it out on their own. But the wise will understand. Those who are seeking out the truth, seeking the Lord, will get it. But the wicked will go like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's crazy. That's just an old book. Why do you study this old book anyway? Verse 11 and 12 say, And from that time, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to 1,335 days. So there's your answer. How long is it going to be? 1,290 days from the daily sacrifices, or three and a half years. But if you count three and a half years by 
30-day months like the Jews did. That's only 1,260 days. So then there are 30 extra days. Why are there 30 extra days? Do you want to hear the answer? I don't know. No, we don't know. Like there'll be people with PhDs and all this others after their name, and they'll tell you, oh, it's because it's going to take 30 days for for, for God to, to finally clean up the mess after that battle in Armageddon. And then it'll take another 15 days to, to, to gather everybody to Israel. And that's why it's 1335 and all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, I don't know. Why is it 1,209 days and then 1,335 days? I don't know. Because they're like, well, it's going to take a lot longer than 15 days to get everybody from all over the world to Israel. It's like, well, he'll have his angels do it. Well, then, uh, then it won't even take 15 days. You know, it's just like either way, you're just like picking numbers out of the sky. And so the, the proper answer is we don't know. But the people who are alive then will figure it out. They'll get to the end of the, the 360 days and they're like, okay, 30 days until something happens because then we get to 1290 and then they get to the 1290 and then whatever cool thing happens, it's like, that's great. But something else is going to happen at 1335. So they got 15 more days to wait. What's it going to be? I don't know. Maybe at the end of the 1335, that's when the millennium officially starts. But who knows? Everyone's got their guesses, and we don't know who's right and who's wrong. But you, Daniel, go your way till the end. Basically, go away again. For you shall rest, and you will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Oh, slide again. So he's like, okay, Daniel, don't worry about it. Just go your way. You'll, you'll end up dying, but you'll be resurrected at the end. So good news, bad news? Bad news, good news? I don't know. Just don't worry about it. And, and really, with your life, you're like, how is this going to happen? What's going to happen then? And the answer is, go away. Don't worry about it. God's got this under control. How many of you think that, that God needs your counsel? God, this is too big for you. You need some help. I have the answer. This is what you should do, God. Like, of course, we're not going to think that. But how many of us pray like that? God, can you do this? Make this happen. It'd be best if you did this, and then you did that, and then you made that happen. And make that person nice to me. Telling God what to do. How many of us like being told what to do by someone we've created? You know, it's like when my kids try to say, Dad, do this. I'm like, no, I'm the dad. You have to do what I say. And I'm like, oh, God's my dad. I need to do what he says. He doesn't have to do what I say. In fact, it's probably better if he doesn't do what I say because I don't know everything. And you know how we, we always tell, like, the quarterback what to do during a football game? Through the TV, like, he can magically hear us. Throw the ball to that guy. He's open. Or we're, like, yelling at our TV again, telling the president that what he should do. Send more troops in. Pull the troops out. Do that. Don't do that. It's like, well, he's, he's, the, guy, he's the guy with the office. And whether or not we like him or agree with him, we don't have all the information he does. He's making the best decision he can, hopefully, prayerfully, off of all of the information that he has at the time. But the only one who knows more than him at that moment is the Lord. The Lord knows what we should do. So if you're going to pray something, pray for the Lord's will to be done. Pray for whatever decision he thinks is best becomes whatever we think is best. And when someone says, should you do this, should you do that? Like, yeah, maybe. I'll pray about it first. And then you ask God, do you want me to do this? Do you want me to not do that? And you wait for his answer. And how will you know when he answers? You'll know. Start reading his word. The more you read your word, the more in tune you get with God's voice. And then you'll start hearing him speak to your heart. Someone asked me once, when you hear God, is it like an outside voice or an inside voice? It's an inside voice. Where does the Holy Spirit live? He lives inside of us. So it's going to be an inside voice speaking to us from our heart, not this big, booming voice from heaven. That'd be cool, though, wouldn't it? But whatever he tells you, you're responsible to do it. 
like Pastor Bud said earlier, that God told me to come to Chico, that's a cool story. I came up, I met Pastor Sam and his wife and like 40 other people from here when I went to Israel with Pastor Tony. I had a great time with them. And then it's like, I want to go visit. Some friends of mine had a daughter who was going to school here, and I said, and, and they said, we're going to go visit her, and I said, can I come? Not to visit the daughter. I didn't even know, who, didn't even know her, but it's like, can, you, can I come and then hang out with my friends, and then I'll, and then, uh, I'll go home. Uh, actually, I, Pastor Tony drove, gave me right home after that visit. And when I got back, everyone started asking me, are you moving to Chico now? No, I just went to visit my friends. And then, like, everybody started asking me, I hear you're moving to Chico. But who's telling people I'm moving to Chico? After all, like, I guess I should pray about it. And I prayed about it. And I took a shower. And I was just singing worship songs in the shower, which is the best place to sing, two, because the acoustics are better, and two, because nobody else can hear you. That's really, nobody was home at the time. I, I, I make sure I don't do it when people are home. And so, you know, it's just like... And I, as, I was, as I was singing, I just started hearing some, like, low rumbling sound. Not from outside. It wasn't like it was an earthquake. I just heard them. I was like, what is that? And they were getting louder and louder. And I realized that they were all inside my head. And I remembered that verse in Romans 8 where it says the Spirit will pray. We don't know what to pray. The Spirit will pray for you in grumblings that cannot be uttered. Like, this sounds a lot like what that's describing. And after a while, it all stopped. And the only thought in my head was, I'm moving to Chico. But I knew it was from the Lord. I knew it. So I quit my job, packed up my stuff, I moved out here. I didn't even have a place to live. I slept on someone's, on someone's couch. If I got there at that time, he had like four or five other people staying at his house, at his apartment. So if I got there in time, I got the couch. If I didn't get there in time, I got a floor. And I was there for a week. And God provided a place for me to move in with this guy. God provided a job for me. Like, God just provided and provided and provided. And he just told me to do it. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. I don't have anything to lose. Especially with the Lord, you don't have anything to lose. Everything's just a big adventure. But this world is temporary. It's going away. Do we have our treasure stored up here on earth or in heaven? The Bible says, that the wages of sin are death. So that means you sin, you burn death. That's how it works. God doesn't like that either. So he sent his son Jesus to die for you on the cross so that you could go to heaven and be with him forever. But you still have to choose it. The sins are paid. It's like, it's like someone giving you a plane ticket. Hey, come visit me. We'll go to Disneyland. I've got the, the, the plane book. I've got the, your hotel book. I've got a car waiting to pick you up. I've got uh, tickets to Disneyland. Come on, let's go. You're like, great, sounds wonderful. You get the tickets, and then you don't get on the plane. The whole trip is canceled. Everything's wrong. You have to take that step out in faith. Jesus, I know you died for me, and I'm going to walk in you. That's what we pray. It doesn't have to be a great long prayer. I mean, when, when Peter was drowning in the sea, his whole prayer was, Lord, save me. Guess what? It was good enough. Jesus reached down, picked him up, says, oh, you have little faith. But he's like, he had some faith. He had faith enough to get out of the boat. The rest of the disciples were in the boat just watching. And I'd rather be Peter in that moment than the other disciples because I doubt anyone laughed at him when he got back on the boat. It's like, Peter, you didn't have enough faith to walk on the water. Silly boy. You know, it's just like they stayed in the boat. They was just like, he got out. I want to be the kid that gets out of the boat and walks on water with Jesus, even if it's only for a little while. Jesus says, or not Jesus, Paul says in Romans 10.9, it says, if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you'll be saved. If you want to be saved, that's how to do it. Believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and make that confession with your mouth. And once you've confessed to being Jesus, then you are saved. You are a new creation. You have your whole life ahead of you. It's a whole different life. It's not like it was before. And, the, and Jesus says, store up your treasures in heaven, not on earth. Let me just read it so I don't mess it up. 
Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where, not, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's his commandment to us. Store up your treasures in heaven. The things that you can spend now. Think of the things that you can spend. You can spend money. You can spend time. You can spend energy. Are you spending those three things for stuff in heaven or for stuff now? You spend it on an Xbox or a Nintendo Switch, guess what? That's now. You don't get to bring that to heaven. You spend your time at the gym working out to get really big muscles, that's for now. Those muscles don't go with you to heaven. They don't even last you the rest of your life. You spend your, 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 your energy doing, doing stuff on your yard and your house. That, looks, that might look great, but it's only for now. It's not for heaven. You don't get to bring your house to heaven. Spend your energy and your time reading the word and living it out. Spend your money helping other people to receive the word because the things, two things that I figured out to get to go with you to heaven is the word of God because it's forever and people. The more people you can, you, you can help believe in Jesus Christ, the better everything will be there because there will be more people to hang out with in heaven. I think if I told you and if I could convince you that for every $5 you gave me, I could make a new believer, not like I would make him from nothing, but I'd be able to get, to get somewhere and tell someone about Jesus and to be a new believer, you'd give me a bunch of money. If you truly believe that I could do it for every $5 you gave me, I can't, so don't do that. Because you realize how important that is for people. It's brand new life. If somebody was dying in front of you and somehow you could rescue them for from death for $5, you just whip out your wallet and give them $5. If that would make it different between life and death. But the life and death is not $5. The life and death is a simple message. Jesus died on the cross for you. Will you give your life to him? Simple message, few words. Are we rich enough to say it? Let's pray. My Lord Jesus, you are an amazing God. Thank you for this time where we get to study the entire book of Daniel. Thank you for the encouragement we have, Lord, and this earth is temporary. We, we like it, we enjoy it, but it's passing. And I pray, Lord, that we would focus on what is eternal, on the good. And I pray, Lord, with everything that we are, with what we say, what we do, what we speak, that we would share your love with people because other people don't know who you are and they don't know the love that you have for them. And if they only knew that you loved them, their life would be better. We pray, Lord, that you would speak through us to them so that they would know your love. And if there's anyone here tonight has not yet chosen to give his or her life to Christ. This is your night. This is your moment. Jesus died on the cross for you while you were sick. In fact, the Bible says that he died for us while we hated him, while we were his enemies. And even on the cross, he forgave those who were killing him while they were killing him. He forgave them. That is the extent of the forgiveness and the love of so bad that you have done that God won't accept you. But if he accepts you, he's wanting to change you. He's wanting to make you a new creation, a better person. And when you say yes to him, you're saying yes to his lordship over your life. Because you acknowledge that he knows better than you. And since he knows the future. He knows what all the best decisions are for your life. Submit yourself to him. Is there anyone in here tonight who wants to do that for the first time? Who wants to be a changed individual? Loving the Lord in the way that we should because he loves us. He died on the cross and rose for us. He calls for us to be by his side ever and ever and ever. And I said yes to that. Do you want to say yes to that tonight?
And if it happens to be you watching this from home or at a later time, just pray out to Jesus. Lord, I have sinned. And I understand that the wages of sin is death. But you died for me so that I could live for you. Jesus, I accept you right now as my Lord and Savior. Please be my God. Let me be your child. Praise in your name.